probably got told like in the previous day. Company Inc. 
an independent financial advisory and wealth management firm. Steve's vision was based on simple concepts about what clients want, comprehensive, integrated financial advice that is proactive, objective, impartial, unbiased, and continuously applied. Cassidy & Company has been nationally rec recognized as a leading firm and has grown from $40 million in assets under management to $2.4 billion. In the past three out of four years, Steve has been recognized as the number one financial advisor in the state of Virginia by Barron's. The sum of his proudest accomplishments are Cassidy and Company's repeat recognition as best place to work by the Washingtonian, Washington Business Journal, and Virginia Business Magazine. Steve has served terms as past president and chairman of the Financial Planning Association and the National Capital Area. In 2003, Steve received the FPA Leadership Award for Outstanding Service to the Profession. In addition to his professional achievements, Steve continues to be involved in the Radford University community. He and his wife of 33 years, Mary, are strong supporters of the university and its students. In 2016, Steve was awarded with the University's Outstanding Alumnus Award. He was awarded the honor once prior in 1999. In March 2015, he was the executive in residence. Steve and Mary have endowed a Radford University Scholarship Fund for several students over the years who demonstrated financial need. He is past chairman of the Radford University College of Business and Economics Council. Steve has served two separate terms on the Radford University Board <coughs> and Visitors and was the winner in 2005, RU, uh, was the winter 2005 Radford University commencement speaker. His eldest son, Chad, Following, him, following his footsteps and graduated from Radford University in 2007. Steve is proud of his Highlander roots and continues to recruit graduates from Radford University to work for Cassidy and Company Inc. Currently, eight, three of whom are here with us today. Please join me in welcoming Steve Cassidy. Thank you very much. How you guys doing? <laughs> very proud of all of you. Because it's Saturday morning. <laughs> you guys look great and you're all here. Yeah, we were at BTS last night and nobody was there. <laughs> I told Kay Hawkins, I said, nobody's there because they're all going to be here tomorrow. They're all home sleeping. <laughs> so I got to do a selfie, right? Ready? Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one would believe it that you all were here on Saturday. So it says a lot about you guys that. Sorry, Bob. Bob said, make sure you turn on your mic, dude. 27 times, you didn't listen. Can you hear me? Hello? There we go. Yeah. It says a lot about you guys that you're here today. Uh, it says a couple things. It says that you are the top one or two percent of students that would get out of bed on a Saturday morning and prepare preferably Friday night to be awake and attentive this morning. It says that you are interested in bettering yourselves. It says that uh, to me, based on the 20 years of experience as a professional, that you're going to probably be uh, not necessarily the head of your class, but the head of your professions. So congratulations for being here. Now as a preface to my talk, I'm just going to tell you that if you don't write down everything I say in the next 30 minutes, you're stupid. Because the things I'm going to tell you will transform your life. And the reason that I am so good and confident about this is because I've made every stupid mistake a person can make, sometimes twice. So making mistakes and learning from them is one of the str strongest uh, foundational things that uh, you can uh, talk about in terms of uh, what the attributes are of being successful. So those of you that didn't bring anything to write on, sorry about that. The fact of the matter is that I'm going to give you some stuff. 
easy to understand things. That if you follow these simple principles, your life is going to be transformed from what it would otherwise have been. I think that the nature of today's presentation is, my presentation is, I want you to walk out of here and say, my gosh, really learn some stuff today. Some things that you don't, uh, that they're not necessarily complex, they're easy to understand, easy to apply, things you can put in practice right away. And if you do them, uh, you will have a much different life than you otherwise would have had. And I'm not special, I'm not super smart. I've just made lots of mistakes and different between me and a lot of other people as I learned from my mistakes. And I hope that uh, if you could go back, I could go back in time to when I was a graduating senior at Radford or even a freshman at Radford and say, hey, I'm from the future, Steve, don't do all this stupid crap in the next 30 years. I would have been a much better person. So it's a jump start for you. That's hence the title of our, of our uh, meeting today. So I guess my job is to give you some tips, some things that you can do, things that you can put into practice that will help you be stronger as a person, uh, stronger as a candidate for a job, stronger as an employee, stronger as a friend, stronger as a life partner, husband, wife, uh, whatever. Uh, and so I want to get started on, on those things right away. There are basically 12 things I'm going to talk about. And they're simple stuff, uh, things that I believe are uh, absolutely imperative foundational things that you have to have in place in order to have a reasonable chance of being successful. And they're not necessarily in any order. If I thought about this a little bit better, I might have put it in some kind of smart sequence, but I didn't. The first thing that I think is important is fitness. Fitness and balance, they're kind of the same thing. So one of the things that's important uh, is having stamina, having the ability to take punches, to be able to, uh, to handle stress, and all that comes from being fit. And being fit is it's easy. You know, getting in shape is easy. All you have to do is work out and eat less. Any questions? <laughs> so see, like, a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk to you about today, it's not knowing how to do it. That's the challenge. It's doing it. You have to just do it. And one of the things that makes me good at what I do is I kind of just jump off the top of tall buildings and don't really worry about the consequences. It doesn't always work right, but I certainly recommend that's the way you do it. But the takeaway is just do it. Stay fit. Go to the gym. Make sure you work out, make sure you take care of yourself. Also, being fit doesn't mean you work out all the time and you do gym all the time. It just means you have a balance in your life. A balance of work, a balance of fun things, a balance of relaxation. But fitness has to be part of it, especially when you get to be really, really old, me. Then you realize how important fitness is. So just for example, I was biking in Eastern Europe two weeks ago and I hit my bar. And uh, going 40 miles an hour, the car hit me and uh, rode a bike. And, I, uh, I you know, landed in the grass, got right up, and you know, was, I had injuries, but the fact that I'm in shape uh, has had a lot to do with me not being dead right now. Being able to get out of the way of the car, being able to get up after being struck, um, you know, it was, it was important. That's a radical example, but the reality is that this is extremely important. Don't forget it. So I want all of you to go to the gym this afternoon. We're going to be there to check and make sure that you are all there. <laughs> um, one of the most important things I'm going to tell you today is this secret to my success, and it's also a great way to seem really smart, really interesting to people that are around you, and to get all kinds of knowledge really, really quickly, is to be a good listener. Have good listening skills. So one of the things that uh, I would encourage you to practice is having a conversation with somebody where you don't say anything other than questions. There's nothing that comes out of your mouth other than questions. And one of the things that we do, our, how many of you have any idea what my firm does? I mean, honestly, does anybody really know? Not surprised. So our firm is it's okay. Our firm essentially, we, we go to people and we say, do you have any money? Can I please have it? That's basically what we do. So we invest money for very wealthy people. Our firm manages $2.4 billion, which is $2,400 million for very wealthy investors. And they give us the money and we do with it what we, what we think is right at our discretion. And it's a really great business. But the fact of the matter is the reason that our firm is good and the reason that people are willing to give us money and let us invest it at our discretion is because they feel like we know them. And the reason they feel like we know them is because we listen to them. So I want you to write this website down. Very, very important. www.wwhdi.com. It's not a website. It's something to help you remember something, which is the first letter of words that start with questions. What, where, when, why, who, how, did, and if. So if you write those words down when you're talking to your roommate, do it this afternoon, it's really fun. When you have your roommate, you have a conversation with him, and you start out with, what did you do last night? You don't know, tell them to be teased, you don't know, tell them to be Okay, where did you grow up? 
When did you decide you wanted to be a veterinarian? How did you get to Radford? Well, if you're thinking these things, these words, keep them in your head. When we're on the phone with clients, we're in a meeting with clients, we write this www.wwdhi down on a piece of paper because we don't want to be saying, yeah, I went to Europe, I got hit by a car, me, 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 me. It's all about the client. It's all about the other person. So what happens when you do this, I promise you, you do this for a couple of weeks, but all your friends will say, Susie is such a nice person. She's so wonderful. I love talking to her. And they're not thinking, they're not understanding the reason they love talking to Susie is because she's always asking them questions about what they're doing, what's going on in their world, what's happening in their life, what makes them happy. Also, for those of you that will ultimately get married, mainly probably hope all of you, all of you I'm sure, by the way, I recommend marriage, it's great, uh, is a great way to keep your relationship sparky is to always ask questions of your spouse. What'd you do today? And really listen. You can't say, what did you do today? And think, well, I can't wait for the football game to come on tonight. What did you say? I was a good listening. Asking questions and being a good listener, absolutely key to being successful. And it, 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 it trans, transcends all disciplines. By the way, how many of you are business majors? Raise your hands high, because I'm a little guy, I can't say. All right, good. Uh, social sciences, psych, sociology? Okay. And the rest of you are like, what? Just shout out some majors. Exercise. Exercise? What did you say? Computer science. What did you say? Computer science. Oh, okay. Computer science. That's a great major. Really good major. Communications. Anybody communication majors? Good. Great. My CEO, Allison Yu, who's here, Allison Felix, who's here today, is a communications major. So it transcends all of these majors. If you're a good listener and you learn the skills, uh, how to listen, it makes you seem interesting to people because you are interested in them. Say, man, that Steve Cassidy guy is such an interesting guy. Why do you say that? Well, because I had this great conversation with him, and after I had this conversation, I just felt like he was just such a great guy. How come? And he started thinking about it, like, I don't know. I guess because he asked me a lot of questions about me and who I am and what I do. Very, very important. Another foundational principle, extremely important. And this stuff is easy. Always do the right thing. You've heard that. You see, I always do the right thing. And somebody said, yeah, that's a cool thing. You always do the right thing, dude, but most people don't really always do the right thing. In our business, we must always, 100% of the time, not 99.999, 100% of the time, do the right thing. When we have a choice to do something, for a client, for employees, for colleagues, for vendors, whatever, and there's a, a, a diametric choice, this or this, we always have to be able to demonstrate that we did the right thing. Always do the right thing for us. And you know what? How you know it's the right thing? It's really hard. You don't want to do it. It costs you money or allows you to make less money. But these are indicators of almost always great indicators of things that are right, things that you must always do. So at our firm, the ultimate benefit of doing the right thing on an ongoing basis, culturally at our firm, an example of that is we have clients coming in. A client came in the other day, that has $12 million. He just sold the company, it's $12 million, he's gonna invest with us. So he's in a decision-making process. He's evaluating our firm, so he really wants to hire us. So I say to him, ask me questions. What do you need to know about our firm in order to feel comfortable giving us your wealth? Guess what he said? He said nothing. He does have a great reputation. Period, hard stop. Isn't that great? You might not appreciate that now, but you will one day, because every one of you, no matter what you're in, no matter what profession, what your major is, you're going to have to persuade people to do things, ethically persuading them to do things. The heart of that is having them believe that you are trustworthy, and that all comes from always doing the right thing. It's simple. When you have a choice, always do the right thing. And you know it's the right thing because it's usually the hardest or the thing that does benefits you the least. Another thing, simple thing, sacrifice. So Sean Gallagher, who's here today, uh, one of my associates, a rapper grad, amazing young man. I strongly recommend you go to this session. Um, I'll tell you a few stories about him in a minute, but Sean says that when he graduated from, by the way, you know, Radford has a reputation as a party school. I don't know if you've heard that or not. That was my fault, I apologize. <laughs> I single-handedly was responsible for that reputation. Seriously. So I said, by the way, the other schools don't have parties. I mean, we have parties at Radford, it's just our parties are better. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that so it, it, all schools party, all college kids like to party and have fun. But when you get out into the real world, it's going to come a time where you're going to have to do something. You're not going to want to do it. You want to go, go, want to go out with your friends, go to a movie, go to a ball game, or do something fun. But you're going to have to say, I can't. I can't do it. And the successful people in my firm who are here today will tell you, your friends are still going to like you. You're still going to have a social life. In fact, they'll respect you. They'll say, where's Chad? Uh, Chad's home studying for his MSCI 
is Microsoft certified uh, internet sort of uh, whatever it is, Jill, mind you. To the exam which he studied for for six months that he got invited to go out to a party. Sean had his best friend's wedding, Key West, which was, I understand, a great, really fun time. Couldn't go because he had to study for an exam. Sacrifice. You got to sacrifice now, too, to be a good student, to learn things, to get up early on Saturday morning. Very proud of you. Come here, hear guys like me talk. Sacrifice and delay gratification, extremely important. Number five, practice. Practice everything. Everything that you are going to do. Essentially, you, who you are as a business person or as a professional when you graduate, who you are now, all the things that you have, your, maybe not to disparage it, but your moves, the things that you do that make you good at what you do, all require practice. You must think of it as something that's a skill that has to be developed. Just like playing an instrument, being a tennis player, a musician, uh, you know, whatever, singing, whatever, all of those things require practice. And part of the practice is going to be role play. So for example, one of the things I want you all to think about doing, because I know how many of you are graduating in uh, 18? How many of those that are graduating in 18 are scared to death about interviewing and going to look for a job? Same number. That's good. So one of the things that you're going to do in terms of practice is most of you are going to be horrible at interviewing. Because most of the people that we meet, we interview, it's like, oh, God, they were so bad. But it doesn't have to be that way. The way you change from being horrible at interviewing to being really the best you could possibly be is practice. It's practice. So fun thing. You all have smartphones and all have video capability. What I want you to do is two things. Go to Google, and I want you to Google the question, Google the, the uh, uh, phrase, interview questions. Most frequently asked interview questions. You get 100,000 hits plus. Look at the most frequently asked interview questions. Write them down on a sheet of paper. Then you get your roommate. She sits or he sits across the table from you with the phone. What's your name? Zachary. Zachary. Uh, Zachary, I'm your roommate, Steve. Sorry about that. Sit across the table, I've got these questions. I'm going to videotape you. Zachary, tell me why you want to work at Cassidy and Company. And then I'm going to videotape you. And then I'll ask six or seven other questions. And we'll go to any wife's the video. Same thing happens. By the way, only about three or four out of a hundred people will do this. You guys got to beat those three or four people. You do it. I promise you it will improve your skills as an interviewer. So then you'll look at it and you'll, and you'll see, you'll look at yourself in the video and you'll videotape him. And you go, oh my God, I suck. You'll be so terrible. You look stupid. You say, oh, I said, um, and like a hundred times, I'm fidgeting, I'm turning around in my chair, my hair looks like crap, blah, 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 blah. Doing this, if you're that special person that wants to succeed, you'll say, let's do it again. Let's try it again. Take two. And people call me, send me notes and emails, say, hey, we did that video thing. You said, it was really great. And then I've had people come in and interview from Rapid. And I said, did you do the video thing? And like, yeah. We practice on the video so it's fun, easy to do, it's actually a fun thing to do. Most people are too lazy to do it, I hope that's not you, but if you practice that as well as other things, that's just an example of practice makes perfect. Other thing, number six, you want a brand. You know, you the term brand, you like a brand, like Coke or Pepsi or even Rapper is a brand. You are a brand, Zach is a brand. Steve, Bob, John, all brands. So you have to work hard to make your brand as good as it could possibly be to refine yourself to a point where no one can touch you. You are so good that no one can touch you. And that takes commitment, it takes sacrifice, and it takes practice. So if your brand is gonna be how you look, how you talk, how you interact with people, how good of a listener you are, all of these things are totally within your control. Totally within your control. You control how, much, how many resources you apply to making your brand be as good as possible. Now, the Career Center, which is a pet peeve of mine, uh, I've supported the Career Center since 1996 when I came back to Radford uh, to help. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great resource and it's getting better and better all the time. President Hemphill is all about the Career Center, thinks it's great. They have all kinds of resources. For example, mock interviews. Really, really important to do mock interviews. They will also show you about wardrobe issues. Ladies, especially difficult challenge for women in the business world because uh, and, I mean, this is completely inappropriate, but it's true. I mean, I'm going to tell you the truth. The truth is that it's difficult for women because you have to strike a balance between professional, being feminine, not being too sexy, and doing all the other challenges that, that ladies have in the professional world. It's hard to do, so you need help. So you want to talk to professional women, like some of your professors, uh, you know, how to dress, how to react to certain things that are going to happen when you're in the business world. Uh, you know, shoes. Stockings, 
all kinds of crazy stuff. If you put effort into this, you will raise your brand. Fellas, same thing. By the way, dude, pink tie. Love it. I almost wore my pink tie today. It would have been really bad. We would have had a fashion crisis. <laughs> it's really good. But the fact of the matter is that you have to really spend time and understand what people are wearing in the business world. And by the way, it's not what's on the cover of GQ. It's not the big Armani ads. Nobody dresses like that. Nobody anywhere in any business dresses like that. Trust me, I know. We have we manage money for thousands of people, all of whom are, many of whom are, are business people. They do not dress like that. They dress conservatively for the most part, like, like I'm dressed and like my associates are dressed. But think it through. Don't just throw something together. And by the way, instead of buying two six packs of Deli Mart every month, buy one six pack of Deli Mart every month and save your money because you're going to have to buy a nice suit. And a nice suit costs hundreds of dollars. Make sure you buy a good suit, talk to somebody who knows about it. Invest in your brand. You make sure you want to refine your brand so it's as good as it can possibly be. Eight, mentors. Find mentors. How many of you intern? Anybody intern? Good for you. You have to intern. If you're an underclassman, you're not a senior, you should be looking for summer internships for the upcoming 2018. You should be looking for them now. Internships are absolutely the best thing you can do. When you intern, you want to scope out the office. You say, who's the hot shot in the office, man or woman? Who's the hot shot in the office? And then you want to Velcro yourself to that person. The way you Velcro yourself to that person is, you say, I'm an intern, I, you know, I've, I've heard about you, stroke their ego, I've heard you're really great, I want to be you one day, all this stuff is great, don't, don't minimize the impact of ego massaging, because it definitely works. Can I be your assistant? Can I be your you know, boy Friday, girl Friday, or whatever? And then you stick to that person, and you learn everything you can possibly learn from them. It's important, because the people that in my, in my business, that we have set uh, 10 advisors, all of whom I hired right out of college. Uh, nine of the 10 I hired right out of college. Three of the 10 are the top 40 advisors under 40 in the nation. All work for one firm. The other, uh, uh, Chris Young, who's a Radford graduate, just got top 40 under 40. He's the last one who's still under 40 uh, in Virginia. Incredible award. To have three people in that in one firm is just unbelievable. The vendors that we work with, my people are the top of the top. I took them right out of college. Poli sci majors, English majors, psych majors. They're all top people. Do you know why they're top people? Because I mentored them. Because I made all these mistakes. I said, don't do that. It's stupid. Do this instead. I'm like, okay. That's good. <coughs> Greatest compliment I've received as a professional, certainly in recent times, Chris Young, the guy I just mentioned, who's a rapper grad. My son, Kyle, who's also going to be a financial advisor, um, and he and I were at lunch, and Kyle said to Chris, who he really admires, he's known Chris since Chris graduated from Radford, and he was 21 or 22, and now Chris is 40, and he said, Chris, what's your, what's your advice to me? What's your advice to me? He looked at me, and he goes, do everything your dad says. <laughs> Greatest compliment that I've ever received. So I'm not necessarily the guy that's going to mentor, but you have to find a mentor. You have to find them. First of all, they'll love the fact that you think enough that you want to be their mentee, their protege. It's very, very important. Number nine, persuasive abilities. Give you a name. I want you to Google the name. Robert Sandler, S-A-N-D-L-E-R. He wrote a book called S-A-N-D-L-E-R. You can't learn to ride a bike at a seminar. True, isn't it? So if we spent all day today, none of you could ride bikes. I put a bunch of slides up here. Here's the pedals. You get on a bike and you have to watch out for cars, by the way. And you pedal and then you just do the bike like this, you'll be taking this. Okay, then we go put the bikes out of the park and you don't fall on your bus. Right? You can't learn to ride a bike at a seminar. Just like you can't learn to be a complete person going to college. Not a bang on college. College's primary objective is to teach you how to learn. So that when you get into a real environment where it counts, you can learn. So the important point about persuasion is everything you do requires persuasion, even if you're a theater major, even if you're an art major, everything you do requires persuasion. So you need to learn how to ethically persuade people to do things, and I put it this way because it's the right way to put it, that they should do what they don't want to do. That's why we make so much money. That's why our firm is successful, because people need to do the things that we tell them to do. Our clients that follow our advice have great outcomes. They get rich. People that resist us and don't want to do the things we want them to do have bad outcomes because we weren't effective, we weren't persuasive enough. So one of the things you need to do is learn how to be persuasive. And it's not what you think it is. Persuasion is like jujitsu. It's kind of weird. Like you were playing on the ground like, oh, what happened? I didn't get punched in the face, but I know I just something happened. It's jujitsu. Persuasion is understanding how people are motivated to make decisions. So this book, Robert Sandler's book, is real easy to read. And you'll read some of the stuff and you'll be like, 
ever realize how easy that can be. Example. So one of the things that happens is with people, our average fee that a client pays us every year is $21,000. Every year, each client pays us an average of $21,000. <coughs> so what do you think the number one objective? Objection, when you say, would you like to work with us? The number one objection is I'm not gonna pay that money. I'm not gonna pay that fee. So what do we do? What does the Sandler technique tell you to do? First thing we do is, mm -hmm. Zach, how you doing? Steve Cassidy, you're to talk to us about being your advisor. Yes, I am, Steve. You know, I gotta tell you, it is really expensive to work with us. You're probably not gonna want to pay 30,000 bucks a year to have us in the picture. And you're like, what? Well, what have I done? Because it's super expensive. Why a million years would you ever pay 30,000 bucks a year? Well, um, because you guys are really good. Why would you say that? Well, you've got a great reputation and I read about your paper all the time. So, I mean, 30,000 bucks. Well, you know, I know, but it's probably worth it. And after, after you do this, you know, no, no, we, we don't want your money. You know, after, like, please, please take my $30,000. <laughs> please take me as a client. You see? It's like jujitsu. It's completely non, it's completely idiosyncratic. Read this book. It is a great book. And it's, you know, again, it applies to every discipline, not just to sales. <sighs> question you get asked. How many of you ever asked a question? Do you want my latte? Courtney? Question, I'm going to get to ask the question, what are you going to do when you graduate? Anybody ever ask that question? Or what's your major? What are you going to major? Anybody ask that question? Come on, Abby. All the time. People ask me, what are you going to do when you grow up, Steve? It's a great question. It's also a great opportunity. So when somebody says, what are you going to do when you graduate? You say, you say yes, Zach, that's a great question. I respect you so much. Let me just ask you, what would your advice be to me? What would you think I should do? I mean, you have great knowledge of like, like mine. What do you think I should do? And they'll be like, you know what? Because nobody ever says that to them. All you have are these stupid little elevator pitches. Well, I think I want to save the world. I want to uh, uh, help the, the sick puppies, you know, blah, 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 whatever it is you're going to do. Same thing I did when I was your age. Everybody says that. You have to differentiate yourself. You turn it on them. You say, what do you think I should do? So what are they going to say when they go on? They talk to you after it's a cocktail party or something. And they go in there talk to their wife. She says, who's that kid? She says, yeah, it's this kid. Zach, I just talked to him. He said, funny thing happened. Why? And I asked him what he was going to do. He said, what do you think I should do? No one's ever asked me that before. Really interesting. By the way, we had a great conversation. And he asked me a lot of questions because he went to the website, www.wwtbi. Right? You see what I'm saying? So it's easy stuff to do. It makes a profound difference. And those people will remember you when they do it. Differentiate yourself is very, very important. Number 11, uh, second to last thing. You have to think about differentiating yourself. So we are, as human beings, we are pack animals. We like to do the same things. We like to do safe stuff. People will tell you, don't do this. Make sure you do that. Buy the smallest house. Buy a house on the cul-de-sac. Don't buy a house until it's springtime. But all that stuff is crap. Conventional wisdom, which is conventional wisdom, which is what you're hearing every day from people that are advising you, is almost always wrong. And it's dangerous. In order to be different, you have to think differently. You have to say, I'm not going to necessarily buy into conventionalism. So our firm is a great example of that. Everything we do in our firm is different than what other firms do. And every time we hear something being done by Wall Street firms, we say, we're not going to do it that way. It's probably wrong if we do something different. Why? Because there's 8 million firms like ours. And why would people choose our firm? Why would we get nominated regularly as one of the best firms in the country? Why would that happen? Because we're doing the same thing that everyone else is doing? No. There's going to be 100,000 kids graduating from college next year. 100,000 kids, you're going to be competing with all of them. And how are you going to differentiate yourself? You need to think about it. Always think differently. You know, it gets you into trouble sometimes, but getting into trouble is part of the deal, which is the risk-taking thing. Risk-taking is a very, very important part of differentiating yourself. So risk-taking is something that is obscure uh, to some people, but I'm going to give you an example of what risk-taking looks like right now. What's your name? You know, you stand up. Can you sing? I don't know you can. You know the national anthem? Mm -hmm. So you know, we're going to sing it together. All right, you ready? Mm -hmm. One, three, one, two, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> so you were nervous when I asked you to do that, right? And you, Jennifer, you were nervous too because you thought he's going to ask me to sing the national anthem. Right? <laughs> you were thinking, pick up my pick tie, maybe I'll be singing the national anthem. And all of you think, you get a funny feeling in your tummy, right? Everybody? So that funny feeling, you've got to have that all the time. All the time. Every time you go to work, every time you meet a new person, every time you go into a situation, you want to be like, oh, boy, I'm a little afraid right now. I'm a little nervous. 
I feel that way every day, all the time. Every day, all the time. You know why? Because that means that I am doing things. I'm outside of my risk parameters. I'm doing things outside of the box. I'm differentiating myself. Extremely important. Final comment. Understand money. Most of you have no idea about money. You don't understand the fundamentals, don't understand interest rates, don't understand savings, don't know where 401k is, 403b, don't understand taxes. All of that is bad. And you know the thing that's funny? We try to keep it secret in our business, but it's simple. I'm giving a class on how to invest like a millionaire later, by the way. I'll explain this in more detail, but you need to understand money. Don't be stupid about money. Because no matter what you do, no matter how liberal you are, how conservative you are, what your ideology is, it's about money. You don't want to wake up and be 35 years old, have a disabled child, and be worried uh, how you're going to put that person through school, and learn, with a school and a learning style that works for them, and still pay the rent and put food on the table. You don't want to have those problems. You learn about money. Here's the way you learn about money. There's a book. It's called The Truth About Money. You go home, Google it. You buy it on Amazon for like five bucks. A friend of mine, Rick Edelman, wrote the book. It's the best book that's ever been written about personal finance. Easy to understand. Got a lot of pictures and jokes in it. It's funny. It keeps your interest. It's probably 150 or 60 pages. You can read it in the weekend. Keep it as like a you know a, a reference book. Something that's extremely important. It tells you all the stuff you need to know about insurance, about investments, estate planning, about uh, you know saving for retirement, about making sure you have a budget. All of this stuff is important. So I will guarantee you that 99 percent of the people in the room have spent five minutes with me talking about money would exponentially increase their knowledge about money because you're not really taught about money in a way that it's practical uh, for uh, for people when they graduate. So my final point is learn about money. Make sure you understand money. So that, that concludes my remarks. I think we have a few minutes for questions, correct? All right. All right, thanks for your attention. Who's the first question? Yes. What was your greatest failure that you came from? Today? <laughs> so the, that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. The, 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 my greatest failure is has been being a maniac. So that when I, and this is something else that I think is important for you to understand, when it, it took me a long time to learn that feedback was good. When people were telling me things that I could be doing better to hurt my feelings. <coughs> it's like, especially when you have kids, if you have a son or a daughter, and you tell them you know, how to, you try to help them tie their shoes, they're like, I know how to do it. It's like a heart in their chest, a knife in their, in their heart. So my mistake was not being open to feedback, making sure that's what they were mentors do is they give you feedback. So I wish I had been better, better about that. Now we're nuts about feedback, and it's one of the reasons our firm is, is strong. The other thing is not being a good listener. The stuff I've told you today, everything I've told you today is informed by the failures that I've had as a professional and personally. So I hope that answers your question. Who's your mentor? I have a couple of them. One of them is in jail, which is a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, but the, I had a couple of uh, personal mentors that uh, you know told. I, I learned certain skills from them. I could see they were. It was like if somebody does something, you know, you're like, oh, how did you do that? And then you learn from them. I do that. I would move on to somebody else and try and do that. But I had several people, nobody famous, that you know taught me a, a number of things. And, and I'll be honest with you. Um, you just learn by hanging out with the right people. People that have energy. People that sap their energy are bad. People that have more energy than you are good. And I learned a lot from them just by just by being next to them. And frankly, one of the things that's great about the Cassidy Company is one thing I am really, really good at is identifying, attracting, and retaining really outstanding people. And so I learn from them every day. So I've had a lot of mentors, but nobody that I could say, hey, by the way, call this guy, he'll be your mentor. Thanks for the question. Yes. What do you think makes a great employee? That's a good question. What makes a great employee is uh, a number of things. Enthusiasm, uh, openness, willingness to learn. Allison Felix is here tonight as a grad, my chief operating officer, probably certainly the second most important woman in my life, uh, is a great person to ask that question. She's her session today. I would ask her that question. But for me, employees that are loyal, in other words, we make, I make huge sacrifices and, and work hard to make sure my employees are pampered and taken care of, feel secure, et cetera, and I expect them to be loyal. So we have virtually no turnover at our firm. Although people that work at our firm, including Chad, Allison, Sean, that are here today can work anywhere. I mean, 
and they, they, they can work anywhere. And they stay at our firm because they understand our culture, they want to be part of that culture, and that's important to me. Also, obviously, uh, being willing to learn smart, uh, which means different things to different people, is important. And speaking of smart, let me just say a sidebar. Thanks for your question. You know, I graduated from Radford in 1976. I was the first class of men to graduate from here, and I have had to listen to people when they say, where'd you go to college? I say, Radford. And they're like, <laughs> you all have had that. I'm sure as well, right? You know what's funny? I'm telling you right now, don't ever let anyone look down their nose at you because you went to Radford. Because the 220 men that I went to school with, Radford, are all multimillionaires, retired. I'm a chump compared to my classmates. The richest guys in Virginia is a Radford grad. The top 10 richest guys in Northern Virginia, two of them are Radford grads. Not because they got perfect SATs or ACTs. Being successful is not measured by tests. The people that went to these schmoozy schools are good test takers. They're good test takers. It doesn't mean that they're going to be successful people or that they're good people. Now, I went to Radford because I waited too late. I played in the band, screwed around, and waited too late to get accepted anywhere else. And so I got in here kind of at the last minute and it ended up being the best, best experience of my life. I mean, I learned things here that I you know, still use today, and you will as well. And I can say, I can hire. We get resumes from Harvard, Princeton, Columbia every day. People want to work for our firm. Our average employee makes 265000 bucks a year. Average, 50 employees. People want to work for our firm. But you know what? We look at them, we meet these people, and they're knuckleheads. When I need something really difficult done at Cassidy Company, I have a really hard job that I need done, I go to my record grads. Because they're different. They're not good test takers, maybe, but they're different. They're hard workers, they're normal people, they're easy to get along with, they're driven, they understand what success means, they listen, they get up on Saturday morning to come hear people talk. So you should be proud of your Radford education. Don't ever, ever let anybody talk down to you about the fact that you went to Radford. And remember this, when they work for you, be kind to them. <laughs> Other question? Yes? Um, how much thought do you think we should be putting in our grades? Like, do you think we should be like working hard to get all A's? <laughs> 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 so the answer is, I think you should uh, work hard learning how to learn. And I think grades are important, but if you are learning and getting B's and C's, that's okay with me. You know, Allison, how long have you worked for me 17 years? Almost. What was your GPA here? Don't answer. I have no idea. I don't care. So you know, it doesn't matter to me, but it will matter in some situations. Another sidebar, that's a great question. Let me just tell you this. Most of the jobs that you're gonna look at be seeing when you go out of the job market are small businesses, or some knucklehead like me, and, and Allison is gonna be making the decision to hire you. You're gonna be applying in places like IBM, and Deloitte, and Amazon, and places like that. I hope you get those jobs, but most of you are gonna be working in small businesses. The small businesses, the guy's gonna look at you, the girl's gonna look at you based on you. They don't wanna see your GPA. Obviously, you have a 0.7 GPA, it's gonna be a problem. But if you have, you know, if, if you're impressive, if your letter introduction is good, if you practice and your interview skills are good, the GPA is not going to be as important. So you know, I graduated with distinction at Bradford. I was a terrible student in high school, but I you know, had a good GPA here. But nothing to do with my success. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. I'm not giving you a great answer, but that's the, that's the truth. Yes? Um, what do you think is the greatest accomplishment that you have had? Children. Yep, it's true. When you have, uh, you know, Chet's 6'6", six, six, he's a big, good galoot now, but when he was born, you know, he, and he popped out, and, uh, you know, I, I held him in my arms. He said, this big. I don't know, if you look at his little face, I'm like, my God, this is what it's all about. You don't know now. When you have kids, you say, this is why we're here. This is what it's all about. So having three sons that I'm proud of that are good young men is my greatest accomplishment. Yes, Nadine? Uh, what's the one mistake you recommend everyone makes? Stretching, taking risks, and failing. Great question. Take risks. So I mean, do you think our firm happened and then everything went smoothly and then we didn't fall on our butts? Every guy oh, might we made so many stupid mistakes. And we tried things that were different. You know, I said think out of the box and just eschew. Uh, conventional wisdom, we do that sometimes. People are like, you say you shouldn't have done that because it was risky. Well, 
too bad. We did risky things. Most of them work. If you work hard, take the risk, think about it. Don't just take risk for the sake of it, and then manage the risk in an appropriate way. You're going to be different. You're going to excel. Good question. Thank you. Yes, Ms. When you're reviewing resumes, what's like one of the first couple things you look for as an employer? So resumes are stupid. Don't bother doing them. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> so resumes are stupid. Waste of time, but you got to do it. So you know why are resumes stupid? Because there's 200 people in these two rooms. 250 resumes are going to go out. They all look the same. They all say the same crap. Uh, no one pays attention to your resumes except for some HR person who the lowest person on the totem pole gets to go through the resume and look for some keyword or whatever. And then if you're lucky and all the stars align, you get a call and you get an interview. So what can you do to differentiate yourself with the resume? Simple stuff. And by the way, people will tell you, don't do this. Don't listen to them. Listen to me. <laughs> put your picture on your resume. Get a nice picture. Put on your resume. There's a stack of 50 resumes in our office. I'll start looking at 50 resumes. One of them has a picture, which is usually the case. Which one are we going to look at first? Look at this guy. Look at that guy. He's really handsome. Look at him. <laughs> also, resumes always look like this. They're 8 by 10, or 8 half by 11, whatever the sheet of paper is. What if it was a pamphlet? What if it came as a pamphlet? And instead of, you know, I want to, you know, save the sick puppies, blah, 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 you know, hard worker, you know, self-starter, blah, blah, crap, 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 no one's going to listen to. There's a picture of you, Courtney, right, standing at the podium, Sheraton, you know, or here, wrapping your head, standing at the podium, of course nobody's in the room, nobody's in the room, and you're like, we may take pictures of you here, nice outfit, you know, Next question, you know, <laughs> and say, it's several pictures, you put that up there, and people see that, is, is, it, is it fake, are you lying, are you, are you being a poser, maybe, but still, people are like, that, ah, she's probably giving a speech to, you know, the Kiwanis Club or something, and then, you know, Courtney, what should I say, Courtney over, and then, quote, some quote that you think is really cool, you know, whatever, and then, they look at that, and they go, I think I'm looking at this picture on this, I'm not going to look at that, I'm not going to do that. They're going to pick that one up first. They're going to look at it. Then you have some really short, sweet stuff in there. You can put your major, your GPA, whatever else you would normally put on there. And then some other things. And then you really have to go to somebody that you respect, somebody that is successful, and say, what are bullet points that I could put in this pamphlet? Bullet points about me that, not, that no one else has. That's something that's really cool. And they'll say, you know, I had a resume once that said, blank, blank, blank. Oh, my God, I did that. Thank you very much. By the way, get something different than the resume, and it will make a difference. So the best of resumes are, I obviously not wild about resumes, but they are a necessary evil to make yours different. One more question? One more question. OK. We got um, What made you decide to pick uh, people coming out of college for your job instead of people with experience? That is a great question. And the answer is that people that come out of college don't have bad habits. They have bad habits, but they're habits that you can fix. And usually when you come out of college, you know you have bad habits, and it's, you need to fix them. So we hire, people say, why would you hire people out of college and train them to be financial advisors and keep just hiring existing financial advisors? Well, existing financial advisors, most of them are idiots, and we wipe the floor with them every day, because they're idiots. People that come in do everything I say, which is the key to success at our firm in terms of training, have no bad habits. They understand ethics. They do the right thing all the time. They understand that the client is first, and they learn, and it's a fast track for, for them. So all of our advisors have been with me since they graduated from college. We've lost a single advisor. We lost one guy, but it was good that he left, that he really wasn't in the mold that I'm, that I'm talking about. But all the other uh, nine of the 10 are still with us, and I think it's, it's great. And, uh, they were sponges, they wanted to learn, they were smart people. Our, our role at Cassidy Company is to hire people that have innate abilities that can't be taught, they need skills. And all of you have those skills, which is my final comment. One of the things that makes you a success also is understanding there's 10 things that people could have right. About <coughs> 10 characteristics, you, know, you, know, you can think what they are. 10 things, personality, interpersonal skills, intelligence, et cetera. Nobody has all 10, certainly not me. But everybody at your firm will have six or seven, but they're all different. I've got these six, Chet has those six, Allison has these seven, blah, 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 blah. So recognize that people are imperfect, but celebrate their strengths and work around their weaknesses. You build an organization that no one can compete with.
organization and nobody is anything close. That's how good we are. And the reason is not because I'm some kind of genius, it's because I pick really good people and I empowered them to do their jobs the way that they uh, thought best to do them. All right, thank you very much. You guys have been a great audience. Good luck today. Yeah. 